Section 3 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3. Chapter 4. A Good Turn. Along the road to Salenburg, little seemed to be abroad besides foul weather, but there was a great deal of that. The gusts that came flapping wide winged over the bog met the wayfarer with a furious hurtle and grapple, as if for want of better sport they had concentrated all their forces upon his sole repulse, and the drops they dashed into his blinded eyes and against his benumbed hands were as icy as they could be without ceasing to be wet. Their combined assaults were calculated feelingly to persuade a man of his uninfluential position in the scheme of things. His voice in this matter was so tyrannically howled down, or, if of less philosophic mind, to bring home to him the special disadvantages of going half-starved and clad in threadbare tatters. This was the plight of Thady Quinlan as, leaving Lisconnel, soon lapped out of sight behind him amid the grey web of the rain mists. He tramped haltingly away with Mrs. Kilfoyle's cloak bundled under his arm, and the dread of pursuit on his mind, and in his heart a great remorse, the object of which you are perhaps guessing wrongly. But he had also a hope and a purpose, and is therefore not wholly to be pitied, although the one did wane until the other looked impossible, as mile after mile unrolled its drenched and dreary length without bringing him apparently nearer to his goal. All the while, however, he was slowly gaining upon a traveller who had taken the same road a few hours earlier, hopelessly and aimlessly, and even more inadequately equipped than he. It was his sister, Judy Quinlan, from whom he had parted on the worst of terms about three o'clock that morning. The fact is that the tinker's raid upon Jerry Dunn's premises, although carried out with unusual success, had led, not at all unusually, to complications when it was time to divide the spoil. Over Mrs. Dunn's second-best shawl it was that the difficulty arose. Mrs. Dunn, despite her husband's thrifty turn, owned many shawls, few of them inferior enough to be worn at all frequently, and she had pinned on this one three times only during the half-dozen years of her proprietorship. So it was certainly bitter bad luck that she should by chance have worn it to confession on Friday, and got it soaked coming home, and hung it up in the passage by the back door to dry slowly instead of to be all cockled into gathers with the heat of the fire blazing on it used to con as she explained with exasperation to ellen rowe her servant girl who had officiously suggested the kitchen hearth for this precaution proved tragically self-defeating and put its object into the very hands of thady quinlan and joe smith when under cover of the wild, wet night, they forced the feeble lock and made a clean sweep of all portable property that lay within easy reach. The shawl formed the most valuable prize. It was very admirable indeed, being of a dappled fawn color, with an amoresque border of shaded chocolate and amber. But in the eyes of its new owners, its greatest charm was its weight and thickness. Judy Quinlan declared, pinching a fold fondly between a finger and thumb, that just the feel of it done your heart good. Her own shawl was really only a ragged cotton table cover, and had, as she often remarked, no more warmth in it than an old dish clout. I should observe, to make the situation clear, that the taker's confraternity at this time consisted of Thady Quinlan and his sister Judy, and their married sister Maggie Smith, with her husband, and his brother, and his father, and three or four children. 
hence it is obvious that in any dispute which might arise between judy and maggie the latter was likely to have numbers preponderantly upon her side and this was what now actually took place the place being the driest end of the unroofed cabin in dun's boreen where the tinkers had for some time past made their camp the screed of thatch still adhering to the wall sheltered their fire of purloined sods and it burned steadily and strongly between the blasts which made its red flame duck and sweel and sent the white ash flakes fluttering so there was light enough to show how covetous gleams from the sisters eyes flashed together on the shawl of which each held a corner and no great wisdom was needed to forecast a storm mrs smith's shawl was undeniably better than judy's by many degrees but she had not the magnanimity to consider this even so far as to propose that judy should at any rate enjoy the reversion of her own on the contrary she had rapidly planned its division between her two little ragged girls judy for her part had set her heart desperately upon the acquisition and she deemed it her best policy to say in a tone studiously matter of course fay now it's glad enough i'll be to get shut of this old wad that's on me every breath o' wind goes through it as ready as if it was a crevice in a wall fit to freeze you into mortar the very vain device for her sister promptly rejoined with a sarcastic laugh and a tightened grip musha moya how bad you are entirely don't you wish you may which intimated plainly that the shawl was not to be had uncontested at this crisis judy had fully expected to be backed up by thady but he naturally taking a more dispassionate view of the matter recognized with reluctance the futility of pitting himself singly against three opponents two of them better men than he who was no great things at all let alone havin one knee queer therefore he turned his back upon the controversy and feigned unconsciousness of it instead of bouncing up and saying with appropriate action and i'd like to know who's at all's got a better right to it than herself has his defection aggrieved her so bitterly that the fiercest of her wrath turned upon him and after a wrangle wherein all the parties concerned had made liberal use of those acculate and proper words against which the wary bacon warns his quarrelling readers she flounced away into the darkness of the small hours of the stormy december morning loudly avowing her determination never to see a sight of the ugly dirty main-spirited poltroon or open her lips to him as long as she had an eye or a tongue in her head during laughter followed her exit on a skirl of sleet-fledged wind she seethed over her anger for many a long mile to such fierceness was its flame fed by disappointment and more potent jealousy for had not thady the only person she cared much about in all the world turned against her and sided with maggie who was always a greedy grabbing little toad ever since she stood the height of a creepy stool it was an hour or so before daybreak when she sat down to rest under an immense bulging boulder that loomed dimly on her beside the road a little way beyond lisconnel then she began to look backwards and forwards far back to the time when her father kept a little shop in bantry before he was stone broke one bad year and took to carrying the remnant of his stock in trade about in a basket as a higgler which eventually led other members of his family to wander less reputably for their livelihoods she remembered that even in those days that he was always her ally and had lamed himself for life by a fall on the road when running to rescue her from the hutchinson's wicked mastiff who had knocked her down near the gate and was standing over her with a growl and a grin of which she still sometimes dreamed and again she remembered how once she had been laid up for a long while with the fever and had crept out of the union infirmary 
to find that her relations supposing her dead had all took off with themselves to the states and was keeping like one demented over her desertion outside mcnee's public when what should come familiarly around the corner but daddy himself who had stopped behind foregoing his assisted passage because the devil a foot of him would stir out of it so long as there might be e'er a chance at all of judy coming back whereupon it recurred vividly to her mind how she had just called him among other things a great dirty good-for-nothing hulk of a poltroon and had expressed a hope that she might never again see sign or sight of any such a hideous beast hobbling anywheres on her road to which he had rejoined that she might go to blazes and welcome for anything he had to say again it and that be dad a crosser tempered old weasel of a wizened old witch wouldn't be apt to land there in a hurry at last being very tired she escaped for a while from these fluctuations of wrath and ruth into a nook of sleep but the bitter cold routed her out of it soon after sunrise and she took the road again cramped and numbed in the teeth of the gusty showers that were still stalking over the bogland as she went the hills beyond sullenberg rose up frowning before her through rifts in the cold white fleece trailed and knotted about their front of harsh purple gloom on which the streaks and patches of ravines and fences and fields with here and there a cabin gleaming began by degrees to be traced dimly as if a fragment of the countryside were reflected on the dark thunder-cloud but she was now thinking more about her journey's end than about anything she saw on the way thither the bleak many-windowed workhouse at moynalone that she well knew must be presently her fate since she had thrown herself on her own resources three halfpence was all she could command for ransom from the durance into which self-preservation assuredly would not forbear to betray her experience gave a dreary definiteness to anticipation once again she would morning by morning awaken to the grim whitewashed ward to all the old hardness and roughness of existence with a tyrannous restraint and monotony superadded she said to herself it is true that she might as well be in one place as another since she would not have thady to go along with any more the black-hearted thieving miscreant and if she had as much wit in her as an old water-rat she'd just creep away into some dry ditch and be done with the whole of it still as she did come short of that wisdom the alternative continued to lie across her path a murky shadow which she could by no means evade nor disperse the invisible sun was low when judy came to a place where the road forks sending one branch to creep across the level bogland towards sullenbeg and one to climb up among the first tilted slopes of the mountains here the rosebride river comes jostling its way down a rocky ravine spanned at the mouth by a bridge past which the swift brown streams dart along in a more spacious and smoother channel bound by rose bride bay judy stood for a while and looked down over the parapet at the swirls of creamy foam that swept under the arch then she took out of her pocket a battered-looking heel of a loaf began to munch it but before she had half finished it she tossed the crust away into the river being too heart-sick to go on eating once the rage of hunger was subdued she wished sincerely that she dared fling herself after it but she was far too much cowed by cold and weariness to muster the courage for such a resolve perhaps there was not under irish skies that december day a more miserable woman than judy quinlan as she stood all alone in the world on rosebride bridge while a black mountain rampart lifted itself slowly against the shrouded west and the dusk thickened on the long shelterless road 
whence eager blasts whistled a summons to her nearer and nearer till they fluttered her legs and keened about her ears and chilled her to the bone suddenly something heavy and soft seemed to grasp her by the shoulders and thence fall around her in long wide folds covering her from head to foot much as if a small tent had been blown down on her of course she screamed shrilly and almost in the same breath she saw that thady was at her elbow he had for some little time been stalking her warily with the great coat expanded ready to throw over her and having done so was now holding it on with a rough hug the joy with which he had at last caught sight of the forlorn bedraggled figure had overflowed irrepressibly into this joke and its successful accomplishment put the finishing touch to his happiness as for judy if the sun had leaped up again in a fiery flurry till the hills and the plain and the river were all flooded with flushed light gleaming and glowing it would have but dimly symbolized the transfiguration of her world in the twinkling of an eye her stark despair was changed into rapturous relief a miracle which just at first made the marvellous cloak seem almost a matter of course any good thing might naturally be expected to befall her since thady was not estranged and lost to her after all weather now and is it yourself come streelin' along she said you tuck your time be dad i'm here this half hour sure i stop till i would get a trifle of things together said thady and what do you call that for an old flittijig it's not too bad said judy stroking down the cape with caressing fingers a grand weight there is in it to be sure but where at all did you come by it you're not after getting it off them thievin rapscallions of smith's anyway them or the likes of them sure not at all said thady loftily twas in a house way down below there at lisconnel a young woman bid me step in to eat a potatoe and tellin you the truth i'd no fancy to be delayin for i'd a mistrust in me mind that the police was followin the notion i had was to ax her had she seen you goin by only i wasn't wishful to be lettin on i was anything to you in case they come along so i thought she might be chance past the remark herself but out she ran and the first thing i noticed was this consarn lyin convenient to me hand in the windy and wid that i whipped it up and made off for anything i could tell i might have met me fine gentleman full tilt at the door and begorrah it's as heavy to carry as a pair of fat geese however i knew it's distressed you were entirely for the want of such a thing and me jabbers you've got it now troth have i said judy delightedly groping her way about her new garment real decent it was of you to be bringing it to me for perished and lost i did be and that's no lie och but it's the grand one look at the hood there is to it sure it's as good as a little house of your own you might be out under buckets of wet in it and ne'er a tint you'd get whatever ay or for that matter taking a roll through the river there and sorry the harm it'd do you wit that on said daddy with pride but we'd better be quittin out of this he added with a shrug and a shiver for the wind's terrible and there's a shower comin up on us yonder as thick as thatch i was thinkin you'd maybe had trampin enough for this day twill be as dark presently as the inside of a cow and we'd see daylight again before we come to moynalone so we might put the night over under the old bridge there's a good dry strip along one side of it and the way the rain's drivin we'd get a grand shelter judy readily agreed and they descended the little stony footpath that led down to the river beneath the arch where thady's booted steps reverberated hollowly they found as he had said a broadish strip of dry ground for the bridge had allowed the stream ample measure in its stride the little platform was bordered by a scattering of stones and boulders amongst which the shallow water gurgled it seemed to thady and judy that their quarters would be very tolerable 
but they soon made a discovery which promised luxury indeed this was a dead branch which lay at one end of the arch having evidently been floated down the current and perhaps hauled out of the water by some thrifty body who however had made no further use of it long ago that must have been for it was dried and bleached till it glimmered through the dusk like an intricate white skeleton better fuel no one could desire that he made for it at once with knife and matchbox and in a few minutes crackling flames were crunching up the twigs and gnawing at a log the red light washed flickering over the wet walls and was caught on the glancing of the water as it fled by rapid and dark blue smoke trailed up lazily against the frame of the arch blurring gleams of tossed foam as it melted out into the mist but a fire naturally suggested food and judy said ruefully after feeling in her empty pocket it starved with the hunger you'll be thatty and a sort of a taste of anything have i in the world deed now if i'd only known the way it'd be and i passin them houses below in the boreen a while ago i seen where there was a big cake of griddle bread coolin itself leaned again the windy ledge and man nor mortal near it i might a reached it down as easy as puttin me foot to the ground but sure i was that knocked about wid one thing and another i thought i wouldn't be bothered wid it so i just left it what it was i did so may god forgive me she said with unfeigned contrition thady however did not seem to share her regrets he was lifting his cluster of cans off his shoulder and extracting from them a bundle tied up in a red handkerchief is it starved you'd have us he said as he untied the first corner starved how are you and he continued to repeat is it starvin'?" she said while he was undoing the several knots when they were all unfastened the handkerchief was seen to hold a number of eggs and a fair supply of broken bread that he might well scout the possibility of famishing that's something like he said as he saw judy surveying his stores and i've a shillin somewhere besides glory be said judy looking as if she could scarcely realize a world with which there was so much beforehand and we'll be givin them a boil in one of the little saucepans said thady raw eggs do be ugly cold brashes and we've plenty of water handy lashins and lavins of drink runnin on tap there so to speak supper was accordingly prepared on these simple lines with much success they boiled many eggs and ate them using their scraps of bread for plates an expedient not unknown at far earlier banquets and they scooped up water to drink out of the palms of their hands also in an old-fashioned manner but when they had finished that he gave a comparatively modern touch to the entertainment by lighting his pipe he occupied the nearest place to the fire in consideration for the scarecrow-like raggedness of his garments which now began to weigh upon judy's mind amid the comfort of her magnificent wrap froze stiff you'll be in them outer tatters man alive she said despondently sure you might as well be slinging yourself round with the old wisps of spiders webs up over your head for any substance there is in them i wonder now could i contrive to reeve the top cape off of this twould be as good that way as a cloak a piece for the two of us thady however said decidedly blathers not at all is it destroyin it you'd be after i'm plenty warm enough and he rolled the big red handkerchief which had held the eggs in many folds about his neck tucking it down under his coat collar all around there was a surprise in hate in it he said by this time the dusk far and near had gloomed into darkness the black beetle had scared away the grey moth as thady and judy sat with their backs to the curving wall they caught only fitful glimpses of the opposite one when any long fronded flickers of the firelight waved across and touched it more often they fell short and made quivering circles shine 
where they struck the broken water in the midstream. Without, beyond either arch, nothing was distinguishable except glimmers of white foam shaken and tossing. On the left, looking up the river, it seemed as if many spectral hands, borne nearer and nearer, came waving and beckoning out of the night to pass by and away down the river, still beckoning and waving, carried further and further on into the night again. Every now and then a waft of the wind sighed in on them along with the river, puffing about the flame and smoke and blowing ice cold in their faces. When it had passed, Thaddy always inquired, Is it warm at all, Jude? And she always answered, drawing its folds together with ostentatious satisfaction, Och, scaldin! But between the whiles there was little conversation to interrupt the monologue of the river, which seemed to find itself many voices under the bridge. The one unceasing rustle of the main stream was frayed along its margin into a myriad finer noises of murmuring and plashing as the massed foliage on a bough dwindles at its edges into more delicate traceries of distinct sprays and leaves round some stones the water whispered mysteriously coiling in and out of gurgling recesses and against others it broke with a clear chiming tinkle as if elfin anvils rang here it droned on with the bees hum soft and steady and here it chuckled and chirped bubbling up in sudden little rapids and cascades at judy's feet was a thin flat stone which rested loosely on the top of another and flap flapped bobbing up and down as the ripples rose and fell sitting idle in the firelight warmed and fed to unwanted contentment judy watched it half drowsily for a while presently she said that's the very way the lid of our old kettle would be going at home when it was on the boil and me poor mother bid us keep an eye on it like enough to keep us out of devilment och but that was a cosy little room of a cold night do you mind it thaddy ay sure said thaddy but it's one while ago it is that a matter of thirty year and more anyway since we owned the little shop sure now i remember a day they shut it up and put us out of it as plain as if it was only this morning grand we that was childer thought it because of somebody's given us the end of an old jar of sweets out of the windy to pacify us bedad the fightin we had over it was fit to have raised the town but i grabbed meself a biggish lump of peppermint twist and would be slinkin behind me mother to finish it and she talkin at the door to old mrs mcclanagan and i heard her sayin her heart was broke so i got wonderin to myself if the reason was maybe that we'd ate it all on her och but it's the queer foolishness people does be rememberin be like the reason of that is because it's a plenty as anything else with them said thady cynically or maybe a trifle plentier sure he was only brats them time says judy apologetically for anything we could tell we might as well be streelin about under the width of the sky like a string of wild duck as stoppin at home with a roof over our misfortunate heads old mrs mcclanagan next door had a cloak the same pattern as this judy continued selecting her memories with better judgment but twas all tatters at the bottom not worth a bawby to me and thady said with interest had she now and as for me old shawl judy went on it's been a scandal and a caution this last three or four year droppin in bits it is and small blame to it i wish i'd a penny for every mile i've tramped in it do you remember the joke me mother had about its being a contrary thing that people travellin would always begin a mile at the wrong end she'd be talkin that way to hearten up me father but as often as not he'd only let her roar at her to wisht he was that discouraged twas a great wish he had poor man to get her back settled in a little place of her own before he was took but twas in the big barracks of a union at monaghan well it's all one to the two of them now anyway said daddy 
finding that judy's reminiscences of their family history did not tend to enliven his meditations over his pipe ah sure everything will be all one to the whole of us please god one of these days said judy who in her present mood could not easily have realized the keen contentions and scorching jealousies of the night before and when we get done with the trampin twill make little enough differ whether it's one mile we went or twenty hundred only i'd liefer than a good deal them two had had better luck wid it all cruel put about they were many a time and wantin the bit to keep the life in them and it just fretted out of them in the end i'm thinkin the thought of it comes again a body when one's sittin warm and snug judy said gazing remorsefully around her shadowy gusty lodging and then into the flames lighting up a bare earth patch and down at the dark folds that fell about her as she crouched on it she seemed sunk into reverie but after a while she looked up and said without apparent relevance heaven be her bed this night the creature that o you heathen we'd a right to be saying the rosary before we get too stupid altogether the eyes o you are dropping into your head would sleep this minute and me just after lighting me pipe remonstrated thady ah then hurry up and finish it said judy betraying by this injunction an invincible ignorance touching a man's sentiment towards his last screw of tobacco or else i'll be off sound it's the fine warmth makes me sleepy sure with this on me sorra a breath of cold gets next or nigh me to be keepin me awake och then wait till it's out said thady i will so said judy sling another stick on the fire lad that way you won't be perished sittin there in them woeful old rags i've plenty of prayers i might be sayin till you're ready but in a little while thady lingering over his pipe became aware somewhat to his relief that she had gone fast asleep muffled up to the chin in her cloak with her head leaning back against the stone wall he sat and looked at her for some moments with an expression partly complacent and partly compunctious bedad now the creature was being perished alive before i brought that to her he said to himself very apt she was to be gettin her death twas great luck i had in hiry to pick it up it's the hard life the likes of her has whatever trampin round ay glory be to god twas the best good turn ever i done her just at the time when thady the tinker was making these reflections while the firelight flickered and the waters fleeted under rose bride bridge some mile or so higher up the stream where the long mountain slopes are folded closer and steeper about it a great turmoil had arisen in a deep hollow among walls of bare rock down one face of these a huge glistening slab the river had for certain thousands of years been taking a foamy leap but to-night it happened that the rains beating for many days on the mountains had eaten away the clay setting which cemented a ponderous lump of rock into a niche immediately over the fall and the mass had now crashed down into the channel on the very verge blocking all the waterway this however was a door hard to keep shut when every affluent rill and runnel out on the broad mountain shoulders went darting swift and white so that every minute swelled the forces gathering pent in the barred passage as the bridled torrent seethed and climbed hissing behind that barrier the great stone tottered and swayed and before the first foam crest could overpeer it yielded to the weight of waters leaned against it and rocks and flood thunderously roaring rushed down together the sound of it doled into a moan came through rosebride bridge and thady who had grown very drowsy thought to himself that the wind was getting up and that they couldn't have done better than stop where they were instead of to be setting off tramping on such a dirty wild night god knew where they might have to go to the flood that broke away with wave tumbled over wave out 
of the whirling pool had not far to race down its stony stairs before it reached a place with a turbulent floor where the white mouths of other two streams foamed into it through rock rifts loud-throated on either hand thenceforward the water which had threaded the large boulders in heavy strands coiled like monstrous braids of snaky locks rose up and drew together above their tallest heads into a single obliterating fold as it slid on smoothly with only now and then a quiver puckering its surface as if it had rolled over some live creature that writhed its mounded solidity made its rapid motion look strange and terrible where circles of thin froth swam round on it slowly it was as black and white as a bit of the bog in a snowstorm or under the drift of summer daisies at the turn of the ravine's last winding above the bridge it plucked away as it passed a small company of fir trees that long had dropped their cones and needles into the river from a coign of vantage on a jutting crag and a minute after anybody who had looked up from beneath the arch would have seen the glimmering points of foam extinguishing like lights further and nearer lost amid the shadowy on-sweeping of something that set all the darkness astir as if it were one vast wing unfurling and then for a moment in the narrow space lit by the fading fire he would have known that he was cut off from the world by chaos which poised towards him a formless surging front and stooped and fell but as it happened nobody was keeping a watch there what wakened thady was the clang of his cluster of tinware which the wave dashed against the wall behind him but before he knew this it had gathered him up and swung him across with it over to the other side of the arch then he caught hold of a twisted ivy tod and a bough of mountain ash whence he dropped on the bank and crawled up out of reach commenting in forcible language upon the occurrence by which he was still astoundedly bewildered judy who was aroused in like manner had her chance too for a branch of the same tree crooked a friendly arm towards her as she was borne past and she would have grasped it only that the weight of her heavy cloth cloak dragged her down so that instead of returning to dry land for many a long day's tramp she went out to sea in company with sundry wretched off boughs and mats of heather and bundles of wither bracken and other such waifs and strays none of which were ever again heard tidings of any more then they were inquired after in the lonely places they had left only for some stormy days the wrecked and sodden banks of the rosebride bridge were haunted by a forlorn-looking object of a lame tramp who sought vainly what his despair hoped to find as he roamed about in it he had just one spell of consolation which he was often muttering over to himself it was something he called the best turn anyway i ever done the creature in her life little enough god knows little enough but the best good turn chapter five forecasts when mrs joyce used in her last days to predict regretfully that her youngest daughter would never marry she said a bold word for at this time still theresa's years fell short of twenty and she was generally recognized as the prettiest girl to be seen at mass in the small ugly chapel down beyond near ballybrosna some people it is true said that she was just a fairy of a creature and too little for anything and she was no doubt diminutive in size nor had she any brilliancy of colouring to make amends in a hummingbird's fashion for the insignificance of her proportions resembling rather with her dark eyes and hair one of those filmy white blossoms which look the paler and frailer for their knots of ebon stamens or the delicate moth who shows fine black pencilings among its pearly down 
Still, nobody denied that she had an uncommon pretty face of her own, and the neighbors, moreover, always found her pleasant and friendly and gay enough when they found her at all. But they remarked among themselves that one seldom seen e'er a sight of Theresa Joyce these times anywheres about. They supposed she was took up with looking after her mother, who wasn't getting her health over well this good while back. I think myself that Theresa's invisibility could be only in part accounted for thus, as the explanation does not cover the fact that to slip the wrong side of the dyke or turn aside among the screening hillocks and hollows when she noticed the approach of her acquaintances was the course she always adopted if she could achieve it without hurting anybody's feelings. Theresa much disliked doing this as a rule, though she broke it on one occasion in a way that surprised and puzzled those who knew her best. But whether Mrs. Joyce forecast the future rightly or wrongly, she had certainly an erroneous impression on her mind when, as often happened, she wound up her disconsolate musings by saying resentfully, and the back of me hand to some I could name, if she had proceeded to do so, she would probably have mentioned persons who had done nothing to bring about the result she was deploring, and she never thought of connecting it with the events which had accompanied Oddie Rafferty's flitting from the three-mile farm more than a twelve-month before Dennis O'Meara came to the place. Until Oddie took up his abode at Lisconnel, he had always lived with his father, who farmed a remote bit of land out towards Loch Glenglass. It was a holding which had been wrested from the grip of a surrounding bog by earlier generations of Rafferty's, who were a strenuous race. But in Oddie Rafferty's time their energies had taken a turn not conducive to reclamation, or even to the maintenance of what was already won. All Oddie's many elder brethren, sisters, there were none, had run wild, and ended by running it so far afield that the narrow whitewashed house, lonesome and bleak, saw them no more. Its mistress also died, failing perhaps other means of exit, running wild being in her case impracticable, and finding life impossibly dreary without Ned, the least good for of her sons and the household was thus reduced to old Michael Rafferty and his aunt and little Oddy. These domestic changes, in conjunction with other untoward chances, sadly hindered farming operations, and nature made prompt use of the pause. Season by season the patch of tilled ground seemed to shrink at the wish of the greedy black land that girdled it about. The outlying fields grew first garish with golden ragweed and scarlet poppies, and then dull green again with brown knotted rushes and somber sedge and all other marish growths, until the re-annexation was complete, and they once more were homogeneous part and parcel of the conquering bog. Old Michael used to trudge heavily round his dwindling territories, which were haunted by memories of better days. There had been a time when they actually kept a pair of plough horses. I believe that he would have fretted his heart out much sooner than he did if it had not been for Oddie, his only remaining son, whose equals, his Aunt Moggy sometimes remarked rather bitterly, he conceded you wouldn't find plentier in the world than an apple sitting on a slow bush. As the boy grew up, the old man's pride and pleasure in him was tempered by apprehensions, lest he should take off with himself like the other lads. However, Oddie never did this, nor anything worse than wax somewhat overconfident and self-opinionated, and a year or so before his father's death he became associated with Felix O'Byrne in the management of an illicit still off away in the bog which gave him an object in life, and had a sobering and settling effect upon him. He was not more than twenty when his father suddenly died one early spring morning, and he found himself 
left responsible for a few acres well cropped with weeds and sundry arrears of rent to be extracted from their produce whereupon he resolved to abandon the struggle and set up a less ambitious footing in one of the cabins at lisconnel so he got ready for the move by selling off his little bit of livestock all except rory the old black pony who had a very large head and a white face like a grotesque mask and with whom he would not have parted on the most tempting terms as for his great aunt moggy when she heard of this arrangement she resigned herself to her fate which was obviously the union away at moynalone what else should become of her since she was past field work and nobody could expect ody now to be bothered with keeping her idle and he with scarce a penny to his name after settling with mr nugent ody she reflected didn't mind a thraneen what way he had things in the house and didn't care to be keeping fowls so what good would he get out of her at all moggy was a doll and rather cross-tempered old person who had grown up in souring shade and never had a life of her own to live nor yet a faculty for slipping smoothly into other people's her slight intercourse with ody had hitherto chiefly consisted of quarrels in fact only the day before his father's death they had fallen out abusively about the broiling of some bacon and this seemed to make her destination all the more inevitable therefore moggy likewise set about her few dismal preparations oppressed by a stunned sense that the black hour she had been dreading most of her life was now just going to strike on the morning of the day ody was to flit she held a sort of carouse at her solitary breakfast over the remnant of a pound of tea which she had saved after the wake tea was ten prices fifty years ago and a very rare luxury at the three mile farm as she poured it strong and black out of the badly broken teapot the whole one being packed up she thought that was the last time she'd ever have the chance again in the world to be wetting herself a cup of tea and she thickened it recklessly with lumps of damp brown sugar and swung it round in her cracked saucer to cool and tried hard to enjoy it she was still lingering over it when ody came into the kitchen which caused her poor soul instinctively to thrust away the betraying teapot out of sight on the black hob what way was you intendin to go then aunt said ody to moin alone she said turning to face her future with a deep sinking of heart sure i suppose it's trappin over i'll be and i wonder how long you think to be doin it said ody a matter of ten mile where's the hurry at all supposin said his aunt desperately blathers said ody there's room in the cart waitin ready you'd be better bundlin yourself into it than to be sittin here all the mornin delayin us deed then beggars drive as cheap as they walk and i might as well be gettin the lift as far as you can take me the old white-faced pony preferred to pay slowly on the long bog road and as ody always respected his whims the journey barely ended with the march daylight the old sad-visaged woman sat all the while under her muffling shawl in silent apathy undisturbed and as during the latter stages of the drive a blinking drowsiness cooperated with her want of interest in the scenes through which she jogged she naturally looked around her in bewilderment when roused by the jerk of the stopping cart she expected to find herself in the streets of moynalone drawn up probably at the door of the big union workhouse but instead of its long rows of casements staring down blankly on her she saw only the one mole's eye window of a tiny whitewashed cabin peering at her from beneath its thatched eaves and all about it the great lonely bog spreading away with never a trace of any town och we're a through man what are you after doin on me she said beginning to bewail herself querulously sure you haven't brought me to any place at all 
Every hour of the black night it'll be afore ever I'll get there now, and the union will be shut, and what's to become of me then I don't know. You'd a right to have told me. Blathers, said her nephew, get down out of that wit here yawpin. Do you want the folk here to think you're a sack full of old hens? I'm going to be seeing about a bit of fire, it's late enough to be sure. What fool's talk have you about the union, and bad luck to it? You'll find a thing for supper in the inside of the old churn, union moya. And old Moggy, alighting with cramped limbs, entered her home at Lisconnel, feeling blissfully as if she had been unpacked out of the most horrible nightmare. Oddy was probably actuated by several unassorted motives in dealing thus with his superfluous old great-aunt. Pride and pity and perversity and generosity all had no doubt some influence upon his conduct, while long use and want had unawares given her the same sort of hold upon his affections that was possessed in a much higher degree by Rory the pony whose humours were of course easier to put up with than human foibles but the old woman measured his magnanimity by the immensity of the benefit which it had conferred upon her and with a strong revulsion of feeling she formed an opinion of his virtues and talents as exalted quite as that which she had often secretly jibed at in his father accordingly she sang his praises unweariedly among their new neighbours and as oddy was vain enough not to dislike the echoes which reached him he soon began to look upon her with more complacency so that they agreed much better than heretofore she found no small solace too after her long cronyless isolation up at the three mile farm in the company of mrs joyce and mrs kehoe and the other lisconnel dames in short a kind of indian summer of content seemed to be setting in for her moggy's mind however was of the self-tormenting type and soon devised means of marring it they took the form of apprehensions that oddy would presently get married and that thereupon the wife would put her out of it if she had only known oddy was at this time as for many years ensuing far too much taken up with himself and rory and the little concern away in the bog to entertain any such project but as it was she felt that the event with all its direful consequences perpetually hung over her and might at any moment bring her new prosperity to a miserable end her impending great niece-in-law was a vaguely appalling spectre who threatened to take the roof from over her head and the bit out of her mouth and turn her adrift to found her hopelessly at the workhouse doorsteps but it was not until more than a year after their settlement at lisconnel that she endued her bogey with one definite form by making up her mind that oddy was thinking of theresa joyce her reason was that she had one fine evening seen him carrying theresa's water-pail for her down the hill an ordinary act of courtesy enough but the sight of which suddenly darkened the world before her foolish old eyes more dismally than if the golden fleece of the summer sunset had been smothered under the blackest pall ever woven in cloud looms fine colloguin they're having together she said to herself as she watched them and their long shadows down the slope and he sloppin the half of it over the edge instead of minding what he's doin it's throwin' me out on the side of the road she'll be. In reality, Theresa was wondering why there would be a queer black sediment like in the water on some days and not on others, and Oddy was explaining the phenomenon confidently and erroneously on an extemporized theory of his own. But to old Moggy's fears it seemed quite possible that they might be fixing the wedding day. For Theresa Joyce herself she had no manner of misliking at all considering her to be a very decent pleasant spoken little girl but mrs oddy rafferty seemed none the less certain to evict her without remorse and oddy's aunt retired to rest that night in a despondent mood it was just about this time that dennis o'meara came to stay at lisconnel on sick leave 
the O'Meara's lived in one of the three cabins which used to stand near the O'Burn's forge, but which the great famine and fever year left tenantless for ever after. Their household consisted of the two infirm old people with their melancholy middle-aged son Tim, and their sickly grandson, little Joe Egan, who was Dennis's cousin. Now Dennis had been wounded in a battle somewhere out in India, and had been promoted sergeant, and he but a young boy -o, so to speak, and owned four medals, and stood six foot three in his stockings, and was as fine a figure of a man as you could wish to see, let alone his gorgeous scarlet uniform, which was a sight to behold. So if he was not a hero, get me one, as we say in Lisconnel. But Lisconnel was quite satisfied with him in that worshipful character, and found it very easy to adopt the appropriate attitude towards him, for Dennis was good-natured and cheerful and never conceited at all, nor vain when there was anything more to the purpose for him to be, qualities which have an irresistible fascination in distinguished personages and make their followers' duty a pleasure. It was wonderful how his sojourn enlivened everybody, even his mournful little old grandmother, whose gratification expressed itself chiefly in regrets that his poor father and mother had not lived to see the elegant man he'd grown. When she said this to the younger matrons of Lisconnel, they thought that the creature's fate was commiserable indeed, and earnestly hoped that they themselves would be spared, please God, to witness the splendid careers that lay before their own Dennises, at present playing among the puddles. But the older ones had to content themselves with the knowledge that if they had only just so happened to get the same chances, their own lads would have done the very same things, a fact which seemed to give them a sort of hypothetical proprietorship in Dennis's glory. His presence brightened up society as a tall poppy brightens up all a somber potato plot, and his conversation brought strange lands and extraordinary events within one remove, a single pair of eyes and ears, of everybody's experience. For many years after the summer we had Dennis O'Meara up here, made a vivid time mark in our annals, and I fancy that the stories of some of his exploits, with their outlines looming large through a mythical mistiness, still float in our atmosphere. There is at least one legend relating how a soldier out in the east cut off a mad elephant's head at a stroke of his sabre with the hero of which Dennis O'Meara could probably be identified. Altogether he was so exceptionally brilliant a figure, both in himself and in his fortunes, that the interest which he excited had no element of envy in it, as might have been the case had emulation seemed less utterly beyond everybody's reach. Next to his cousin, Joe Egan, a stunted, starved-looking sprisson of a lad, perhaps the most appreciative of his admirers, was Big Hugh McInerney, whom people were apt to call an Omadon. He also was, comparatively speaking, a stranger at Lisconnel, having come there only that spring to give General Driscoll a hand with the building of his mud cabin, after which he stayed about doing what odd jobs offered at that slack season of the year. Now and then he tramped on distillery business for Felix O'Burn, and generally acquitted himself in a manner which appeared worthy of contempt to young Audie Rafferty, who was his companion on these expeditions. Audie expressed his opinion in unqualified terms, saying, "'Sure it'd disgust you to see him moonin' along like an old donkey strayed out of a fair.' But his senior partner, rather to his annoyance, persisted in replying, "'But mind you, the chap's no fool.' He had nobody belonging to him at Ballybrosna whence he came, and some people said that he had been a workhouse child. At the time of Dennis O'Meara's arrival, he was darning the widow Joyce's thatch for her, and not killing himself ever the job, as people said, 
when they reckoned how many days he had been visible crawling about on the top of her little house a conspicuous position in which he looked mrs con ryan remarked a queerer great gawk than he did on dry land he was occupied thus on the first afternoon that dennis walked up there with some of the other lads and while they talked to mrs joyce and theresa underneath the thatcher took a leisurely and critical survey of the scarlet and golden newcomer from his wonderfully polished boots to his sleek dark head and fierce moustache the verdict he pronounced to himself with unfeigned satisfaction was grandeur's no name for him you himself of large and lumbering frame had a shag of reddish flaxen hair which made thatch-like eaves above his small light blue eyes and high burnt brick coloured cheekbones he wore whitey brown rags after the rest had gone on and in he slithered down to the ground and told theresa who was still standing by the door that she didn't look the size of a bit of a ladybird beside the soldier fellow if anybody else had made this personal remark theresa might have been a little hurt by it as she wished herself to be of more imposing stature but sure nobody minded poor hugh mcinerney at any rate she said ay he's a terrible big man isn't he apt to knock the head off himself he'd be if he was offerin to come in at our door end of section three